So right now you you work at a very very high level in the stratosphere of policy uh, in this industry, right? So it's not something that most people are witness to. So tell me, what inputs do you use to establish the kind of policy recommendations that you do? And I know that you mentioned some data that you have, so I'm interested in not only what the data is, but where it comes from and how you use it to formulate recommendations at the, at the policy level. Sure. Um, one of the things is you need to set the table and explain how commercial real estate is important, not just to our world, but to the environment, to the U.S., to various cities. Um, you know, one of the things that doesn't always come up is that when you look at commercial real estate assets and the cash flow they throw off, you know, that's about 18% of GDP. And it's not a number that people would equate commercial real estate with. Um, in addition to that, if you think about where people work, where, where, do, where are the employees? They are in commercial real estate of all sorts. So we house a significant number of employees and without those houses, you know, and in good standing, um, it does suggest that your, your employment rate, you know, is gonna fall. So to the extent that right now you see all of these large malls closing, you know, those are a lot, that's a lot of jobs. Same thing with hotels. Um, and a lot of these folks, particularly in the hotel industry, you know, um, it, it's a fairly low wage environment and yet they count on those wages to, to survive, to feed their children, to house themselves. So to the extent that it's meaningful, and that's something we've tried to get across. Um, and what we've found is that while well-intentioned, many of the programs that have been stood up by the government really do not include commercial real estate. I've stopped asking myself to explain why, because I don't know why. Seems like there's a good reason mm. that, you know. Is it, is it, is it, because, it, is it because it's politically um, unsavory? I mean, there's this idea that real estate developers owners are the wealthy, and so why should we be, you know, padding their pockets and not yeah. putting it somewhere else? I mean, there's, right? You didn't hear that from me, but, but I suspect <laughs> that there's a little of that concern. I, and I don't necessarily blame them, right? I mean, you need to be careful to make sure that those who can do, right? And that you're helping those who can't. And yet, arguably, the ones we want to represent are those, we wanna represent all of our borrowers for sure. And we've worked with all of borrower trade associations very closely to, to bring that message that this is a sector that seems to have been ignored by the federal government. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've not necessarily seen it, seen help from the CARES Act, um, the programs that have been stood up like PPP, um, you know, the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, Main Street Lending Program, both of those programs do not allow for passive real estate to be involved. So we're excluded from those programs. Um, we've tried to put forth and have had some wonderful help from, from Congress, from the Senate, from the House, in terms of recognizing the need, recognizing that we're not necessarily standing up for the public companies out there, say the big public REITs that can go to the, the capital markets to raise funds, right? And we'd like to help them all, but one would argue that the guy who owns three Marriott courtyards somewhere in the Midwest, that's not a guy that can tap the capital markets to get assistance. And so we're really looking to try to help that particular borrower. Um, and, and I'd say to the good, you know, there's been a lot of talk about loan forbearance. Um, and, and what we've learned is that the word forbearance means many things to many people. My view of forbearance is whatever I do as a lender to allow for some leniency in getting you through this period of COVID is a form of forbearance. So we either say we're going to postpone you having to make your payments um, for the next six months with, a, with the goal being when that happens, you start paying rent and those six months that you didn't pay get tacked on to the back end of your mortgage. Right, okay. Or we've forced you to put aside a lot of reserves for, you know, PIPs, uh, for any kind of improvement plan that you have um, go forward that, you know, maybe your um, the, the, the hotel requires that you put into your property, say. Mm -hmm. um, let's use, let's repurpose those reserves, whatever they might be, to pay your mortgage. And then we'll worry about 
replenishing those reserves when everything's sort of semi back to normal. And so there are ways to forbear. And I think within both the CMBS market uh, with the banks and the life companies and to the good, the mm -hmm. banks and the life companies got some regulatory relief on this issue from trouble debt restructurings, which normally would have required that you hold a significant amount of capital against those. Mm -hmm. um, they've been kind of given some relief in that regard. So there has been some help. And as I said, TALF is important, not because of just what it does for the capital markets, but the way in which you quote a CMBS loan is significantly based on the pricing of those CMBS bonds. If those bonds price low, yields go up, means your mortgage rates go higher. So the ability to continue to lend at a rate that is palatable to our borrowers really was really determined by TALF and its ability to tighten spreads, to, to increase CMBS bond prices to a level where mortgage rates could be quoted from the CMBS market that, are, that were palatable to our, to our borrowers. And you know, the fact that the Fed has done a great job lowering interest rates and, and that certainly has helped mortgage rates across you know, the country and across asset classes to fall.